let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get started everyone so welcome uh, everyone so happy uh, you are all here this evening uh really uh, grateful to you for spending um the next hour or so with us talking with russell maltz um i hope you are well your loved ones are well these are unprecedented times that seem to keep going so i'm glad that we're all still here and attending talks and um you know, just being present, it means a lot to me um, personally. So I hope you all are, are well. Um, this is our second uh, Zoom conversation, our second Zoom artist talk this year. Of course, our special guest is Russell Maltz. Russell, wave to everybody, welcome. Hello, Hi hello. everybody, thanks for coming along. Fabulous, and uh, we're here uh, to hear from Russell about his shows, of course. But before we get started, I'm assuming all of you are familiar with Zoom at this point. But for those of you that are not, uh, you can scroll down to the bottom of uh, the screen for kind of a dashboard of icons. Uh, you can open up a chat field. You can rename yourself and whatever you'd like to by scrolling over your video image. And in the spirit of inclusiveness, I always like to remind everyone you are welcome to put up your personal pronouns like we do in all my classes these days. Um, feel free to add those he, him, she, her, they, them, whatever makes you most comfortable. We wanna make sure that we are as inclusive and supportive in this environment as um, humanly possible. So uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording tonight's talk. We do that to share it outward, out over the internet with folks that can't be here. And we'll post it up on our website and on our YouTube channel. Again, so other folks can hear from Russell. Um, you are, of course, welcome to keep broadcasting your video if you feel so comfortable to do so. Linda, I love seeing your face. It makes this so much more meaningful than staring at your name on a screen, but feel free to uh, do whatever um, you'd like to do. Uh, we're going to turn uh, the conversation over uh, around 7.45 for q and I'm sure all of you have a million questions for Russell. I'm going to try to not over talk with him here. Uh, so uh, we will definitely leave time for Q&A. So if you have questions, make note of them. And um, again, we'll leave plenty of time uh, at the end. Uh, my name is Matthew Delegate. I am the co-founder and director of Minus Space in Dumbo, Brooklyn. We founded the gallery in 2003. So we're 19 years old at this point. We're almost out of our teens. So I feel very good about that. Uh, we have survived many a crisis over the years, including COVID and stock market tumbles and wars that are unnecessary, but I'm really happy to uh, have persisted for this long and uh, to continue to be able to do what we do. I feel very lucky to uh, present artists' work at the gallery and to present presentations like this, um, of course, as well. Um, we at the gallery focus specifically, as most of you know, on reductive abstraction. Um, our tagline is that we present the best of the past, present, and future of reductive art on the international level. And of course here tonight, we are uh, all gathered to discuss Russell Maltz's new multi-part exhibition called Painted Stacked Sight. Uh, this is his uh, third solo show at the gallery. Uh, we've been uh, collaborating Russell for well over a decade at this point, um, both here in New York and in projects as far away as Oaxaca, Mexico which was a decade ago. Emmy Winter's here somewhere. Welcome, Emmy. She was responsible for that collaborative project. And um, we are uh, going to talk about Russell's sort of exhibition in multiple parts. He's organized an exhibition in five separate installments, uh, three of which are currently on view. Uh, there's uh, one exhibition on view regarding his pool project at 16 Main Street, which is our main space in Dumbo. Uh, right around the corner, there is a second installation uh, on J Street. The address is officially 28J, but for some reason it comes up incorrectly in Google for whatever reason. So if there's trouble getting to that space, just type in 20J Street and it's on the corner of J and Plymouth, also um, in Dumbo. And then Russell, you've also opened up a project, sort of a social practice project over at the Hillman Garden. Luther Gullick Park at 100 Broom Street on the Lower East Side. And that's gonna be ongoing through uh, the middle of summer. So um, again, three part projects that are gonna transition over into another one uh, and then another one uh, after that. So five in all. Now, um, again, welcome Russell. Uh, for those of you that don't know Russell all that well, I have a few opening words about him. 
He was born in 1952 in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Yay, Brooklyn. Go, Russell. <laughs> yes, uh, and he's one of the Brooklyn, leading... Brooklyn, East New York. East New York, thank you very much. Um, and he's one of the leading reductive artists on the uh, international level and certainly of his generation. Over the past 40 plus years, he's exhibited his work in solo and group exhibitions internationally, including Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Austria, uh, Israel, Switzerland, Mexico, and of course the United States. Uh, the first comprehensive retrospective of his work uh, was mounted by the Stadt Gallery in Saarbrücken, Germany in 2017, and was accompanied by a very big book published by Kerber Verlag, which is available on our website. If you don't have it, uh, you should order it. It's 230 pages and exhaustive about Russell's practice. Uh, here at the gallery, he has previously um, mounted two very engaging solo exhibitions, uh, one back in 2017 and another surveying his ballpark series works back in 2012. Uh, he also mounted a two-person show with uh, artist Melissa Kretschmer, who I think all of you should know or do know here, a uh, terrific artist back in 2015 regarding their use of plywood of all things. So that was the conceit of that exhibition. Uh, back in 2012, he mounted a very large site sensitive installation um, at the Museo de Pintores Huaqueños in Oaxaca, Mexico, that was part of our big survey there, um, which was super exciting. And parts of those elements, Russell PVC pipe, uh, make a cameo in your new project over at 20 J Street. He's mounted solo exhibitions uh, far and wide, including at uh, Gallery Michael Sturm in Stuttgart, Gallery Wenger in Zurich, uh, Alejandro von Arts in Miami. Uh, Gallery Weinberger in Copenhagen, uh, the Atlantic Contemporary in Atlanta, Gallery Schlegel in Zurich, and the Ringling School, among so many other places. His work is included in collections far and wide, including the Brooklyn Museum, uh, Yale University Art Gallery, Fogg Art Museum, so I'm referring to my notes here, and um, the Museum of Moderner Kunst in Ottendorf, Gallery of Western Art in Perth, Australia. His work has been reviewed far and wide, including the New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Russell also sits on the advisory board of Critical Practices, Inc., CPI, which supports the emergence and development of new practices within the field of cultural production. And I think all of you probably know that CPI was included in the 2014 Whitney Biennial. So um, wearing lots and lots of hats, Russell. So congratulations on all of that. So without further ado, uh, welcome Russell Maltz. We're super excited to have you here. And um, you know, it's um, a really exciting time in your work. There's tons going on. I've known you for a very long time at this point. I've never seen you more active, more um, sort of questioning, more experimental across all of the various uh, capacities of your work. And uh, we're really excited to kind of show those over an extended period of time through July 30th uh, here at the gallery. So what we have up right now at the gallery is um, a sort of a survey exhibition about a project you um, started in 1976 called the Pool Project. This is kind of your first big installation site sensitive responsive project. Um, and then of course, we also have a project that is brand new over at 20 J Street. Uh, that is an installation um, with um, sort of sourced industrial commercial materials. So I would love to start with the pool project if that's uh, okay with you, Russell, because uh, it's the oldest, it's the precedent here. And tell us about this project. It happened from 76 to 79. It started out with an opportunity with an abandoned swimming pool. So take right. it from there, Russell. Thank you, Matthew. And thanks for everybody uh, <clears throat> for tuning in. Um, back in 1976, I was a graduate student at Long Island University at CW Post College. And uh, as part of the deal, you know, uh, I was a graduate assistant teaching drawing and, and painting. Part of the deal was supposed to give you a studio to work in. Well, when I got there, now the studio was a, a seven by eight foot room, including a door and a desk. And I thought, well, okay. And I said, I immediately went to the department. I said, well, I can't work here. This does not fit my, um, you know, my vision of how I'm going to make my work while I'm here, you know, at, at the school. 
and and they said, well, you can use this, you can use the regular uh, studios where everybody else works. And I kind of like, um, it wasn't a good day <laughs> for me. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was trying to figure out how I was going to, you know, make make work. And I was getting very, very interested in installation at the time. Uh, PS1 rooms uh, had just opened at, at the new PS1 in, in Long Island City, Queens, Alana Heiss, and so many artists that I revere had already made installations there. And it just seemed uh, very important for me to start exploring other things than making paintings on canvas at the time, which, which, which is what I was doing. And I was walking up the hill at CW Post College and lo and behold, I came to the top of this hill, looked over and there was an empty swimming pool. And the light, you know, when the light goes on in your head and you get some, oh my God, this, this is amazing. I felt chills. So at that point, it was a number of things which really fit together for me. It was an independent space to work in. It was quasi guerrilla because no one really knew about it. No one was working in it. I didn't have permission to do anything, which made it more exciting. And I went in and cleaned, that, cleaned it out and started working in there sort of incognito until someone noticed and started questioning when I what I was doing. And um, uh, I said, Not, nothing much. I'm just cleaning the space out, you know, and uh, I'm doing a few things here and there. And, and uh, well, finally, I had to go to the art department and they had to give me my, their blessing and they did. And I started making my installation work there and, and uh, I worked in, in the space for a couple of years, uh, doing two different types of installations uh, concerning my drowning point. And then uh, the artist Ted Stam was hired to come to the school and teach because one of the other professors was leaving and he was filling his, his spot. And uh, Ted and I became fast friends. He took a look at the pool. He goes, this is great. We should do something. We should invite artists, other artists to come and do works here because it, it's just, you know, it's just so fertile. And we put together a visiting artist project, um, which about 30 artists came out during the time of my, uh, when I was doing my MFA. And I did the last, next to the last project actually out there. And so I, I worked through three, three different projects there, um, experimented a lot, had a great time with seeing what other people were exper experimenting with and, and doing in the same space over those years. And uh, subsequently, that led to me being, uh, being able to do a room at PS1 as a special project in 1980. Um, the ideas that I have uh, was you know, actually working with at the time back in the 70s are still very much in, uh, informing my work today. And, and the way I approach a space, the conditions and, and the, uh, and, and the proposals I, I put forth uh, in, in resolving and, and asking questions about, you know, what, what an artwork can be. Terrific. So this is the um, sort of the first sort of uh, a, a sort of a project and a solution all at once. So that um, that studio was way too small for you. Yeah. Right? You needed sort of like much more sort of expansive, boundless space to work in, yes. and it became the venue itself for the for the the the, the, the art, the art making, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this and this pool. I mean, you you was it a gorilla project? Did you have permission to use this pool not, not at the beginning? Or was it? Not, Not at the beginning. beginning. And, and um, I have to say that it took about, it took a few months, but I never left it. I never, I never let them get me out. I kept working in there and, you know, and just kept telling, listen, I'm from East New York. So I told everybody a different story if there were a different person that came to kick me out. So, you know, they, that would take a while to re research. And then the, by the time they came back, you know, another work was done or another part of a work was done. And then the art department, they got on board and, and the chairman called the, called the president of the college and they said, we're doing something up here, you know, hands off, you know, and then it was mine. It was good. Great, great. So what we have at the, uh, the gallery that relates to this first CF efforts, right. we have uh, drawings, we have ephemera, we have studies, we have a lot of work on paper. What kind of projects did you do in the pool? Can you describe them to us? 
Yeah. The first project was a, a marking of space and time with, a, with uh, these large oil sticks, actually that Sarah used for his large drawings. Um, they were black, you know, you could fit your hand around them and, and just make marks with them. Um, I bought a few cases of those and I filled the entire space, all the walls and floors with marks, concentric marks, parallel marks all around, creating a field or a grid. And then I left a spot where you can walk down into the pool that was undone, undrawn on, just to the point at which the water would cover my head. That was my drowning point. And that was called, a, I called it a walk-in drawing. And that was the first, that was the first um, piece. And I think in, in the picture that you're, where, where you are now, uh, over your shoulder are a series of drawings on paper, right? That, um, that are about the same idea, yeah. Fantastic. And the next project, and the next project, there was a point at which I would drown. I painted out all the, uh, the next project, I painted out all the lines with an white enamel paint. And I had a complete white space. So it's like an indoor outdoor white box in a way. Um, the pool was about eight and a half to nine feet deep at its deepest point. Um, and where I would drown, I built a wall. So I couldn't walk past that point. Uh, that was the second installation. And these it, it, in themselves, led me to situational sculpture or situational painting or situational artworks where um, the body is involved in a way that uh, is rel rel relative to the architecture of the space. Fabulous. So the, the two projects that you did, you did one sort of like immersive drawing yeah. work, you, which you painted out and then subsequently realized this sort of second standing. How tall was that wall? Was it eight feet in uh, there? Was it it was it was a, just taller than I was. It was actually everything kind of hope. I, if I recall, and I I'm not. I think everything lined up at the top of my head, mm -hmm. right? Keeping that physical personal relationship to it. Fantastic. So those two projects occurred. Mm -hmm. How long did they? How long were they there? Did people know about them? Did you yeah. tell people about them? Like what what happened with these projects? Because it seems like it was so so specifically on this site and so specifically kind of like underground and did, did folks witness this? Yeah, it was underground, mostly students and, and faculty and, and some friends, you know, artist friends from New York. And then when, when Ted Stam got a hold of it, he introduced uh, me to a lot of artists who he thought would be very, very uh, interested in doing a work out there if they were invited to. And we got clearance to do that. And then after that, it became, um, a larger project with a bit more uh, breadth to it in terms of what was going on in the downtown scene in New York in the uh, in the late seventies. Fantastic. So Ted Stam uh, is a visual artist. I think many of you might have known him or have at least heard about him. Abstract painter mm -hmm. died very young at the age of forty unexpectedly. Uh, we actually presented Ted's work maybe what about six or seven years ago eight years ago in collaboration russell but yeah. he was someone that was a er, an early influence on you russell and then yeah. became a dear a dear friend of yours right exactly exactly and and i have to point out that everything we did there which was contrary to what was going on in painting at the time was situational it was it was to create a situation whether it was sculptural or, or painting wise or performance wise um, it was very, very um, geared towards the individual going into a space and being confronted with a situation that didn't exist before they walked in there. Mm -hmm. right. And then each artist played off what the artist before them did or not, but a lot of, a lot of people really did. It, it became uh, a very, very wonderful um, sequence of one artist after another. And I think about 30 artists did works there. Ultimately, right? And how long, yeah. how were those, so yeah. how were those artists selected? So this is sort of like the part, the second phase, the invitation word of mouth. phase. Word of phase mouth. Part, word it's of like, mouth. It's right. like back in the late 70s, it's like word of mouth. Hey, I know this person who would love to do something here. I, I would really, I think they, you know, it would really, really be great for their work. And it was like, okay, let's do it. 
and then that and, and the bigger it got the more people were recommended and and it just grew and grew it, it grew into an interesting community of people that then i would see in new york or, or and then people would come out to the openings at the uh, at the pool we did something every four to five weeks that was my next question how long were these projects up yeah. I know Everything some of them were performance-based, so yeah. they happened and then, yes. you know, were recorded in some cases, yes? Yeah, yeah. we have some videos of things and, yeah. That's great. So, and yeah, we, so we have, catalog. so Russell, talk about that. So, so some of the elements, I mean, clearly you can see over my shoulder, it's my virtual background, but there's lots yeah. of works on paper that we have up, diagrams, so studies for things. But then we also have, if you can see over my shoulder, a video monitor. Okay. that's sitting on the floor and what's off off camera here that you can't see is a very cool old school slide projector that is on a continuous loop with probably 60 or 70 slides going around showing us images of things right so there's media involved in this as well right. talk about the video talk about the documentation of this like how did that happen like what did it look like okay so so everybody that came out most everybody took photographs. Uh, mostly, uh, most of the photographs were taken by Ted Stam, Abby Robinson, and myself. Each artist would take their own photographs. And we mostly shot 35 millimeter slides. Uh, so we had a wealth of information from all different angles of each particular installation. Uh, of the installation itself, of the openings, people coming out, people hanging out, um, and so over the years, you know, I, I held on to as much as I could, and I have a lot of them. So for this exhibition, I, I put together what I would normally use as a lecture series on that piece, and uh, which is my work and the, all the other artists work in the invitational. Um, and I just uh, got a, a new Kodak, a, a new old Kodak ectographic slide projector. <laughs> And set it up so others others that come to this come to minor space they could they could see all the uh, all the projects in that form in addition to looking at the catalog then you get the whole breadth of the project. Um, yeah, that, that slide projector is like particularly charming. I have to say it's like it's so old school art school right. art history classes. Yeah, and yeah. then it's. Um, you know, most of those images, I, I, I just to share it out here with everyone, I hadn't seen before. So right. they are brand new to me and they are, they go well beyond just like standard documentation of art. There's a lot of like mood to them. There's people in them. Yeah. There's like atmosphere going on. So they're much more romantic than kind of documentary in a way. Oh, okay. Which is very the video, cool. The video. Um, oh yeah. Talk about the video. What's the happening video there? The well, I was very influenced at the time uh, also by earth art and land art. And even though my sensibility was painting, um, I, I, I tend and still do tend to get a lot of inspiration from sculptural and performative work. Um, but I translated in painting language when I make my work. And so at the time, after everybody, most everybody made their works, my, my last work was related to a series of pieces I was doing at the time in other places called Zones. And they were about taking a, a piece of a, a plane or a, a floor or an architectural space and painting it one color and putting a form inside that, a geometric form inside that to create a zone of color that the form sat in. This was a different situation because this was, an, uh, for no, all intents and purposes, a negative space because it was it was carved out of the earth and poured concrete. It was a it was an empty swimming pool, and so I painted the whole pool black to erase everything that was there before, and then extended the perimeter of the pool onto the landscape and painted the landscape black as well for a good uh, maybe five or six feet around. So that was designating that pool and that rectangle as a zone on the landscape. That was my introduction to get myself to actually do a piece of earth art at that time. And that was in 1979. And then the only way that I could satisfy myself to actually see it was to go up an airplane 
and fly over it and circle around and around. And that's what the video is of. It's, it's of um, Abby Robinson and myself going up in the plane with a pilot. It was a little Cessna. We, we left Republic Airport in Long Island and we, we flew out to CW Post and we, we got into a tight pattern around, around the college and he zeroed in on, on, the, uh, on the pool and I was able to do a video of it and Abby took some still photographs. And we got back. That was good. You got back in one piece, which is great. Obviously. Good. You live, live to tell the tale, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those videos also are very charming and they're playing on a loop at the gallery. Yeah. They're, um, you shot them on a video camera, right, Russell? It was an old Panasonic, um, I forget what they call it. It, it had a little, had a little back, uh, tape pack on the side. It was a reel to reel with a, with a Panasonic camera that plugged in. You know, and it was it was state of the art at the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It feels it, it's got it's sort of got this sort of charming kind of super eight quality to, to yeah. it too. So yeah. so again, that's playing as well as the slide imagery, and you've got a large vitrine in the center of the space with all sorts of really interesting ephemera from studies to like a review that the show had to yeah, uh, yeah. the catalog and all sorts of other stuff. So yeah. there's uh you know the the, the the exhibition is like chock full of like really great documentation and artworks and studies and you know multi multimedia. Um, well, the one thing that thorough. the one thing that Ted Stam was very you know, was able to do, and um, he was had a very very close relationship to the people at at um, Artist Space, and he said, well, you know, we have all this great documentation. Maybe they'll let us do a documentary show of the project at Artist Space, um, and sure enough. Uh, in 1980, in the spring of 1980, when they were at 100 Hudson Street downtown, um, we did we did a, a, a one month or five week installation there of all the document, all the all the artists put in drawings, proposals, videos, and uh, photographs of the work. And Kay Larson at the time she she was writing for the Village Voice, and she wrote a nice review of the show. So that's also that that. That is one thing I was able to save at a, from all these years, and that's also in the vitrine. So, fabulous, fabulous. And you also mentioned earlier, Russell Abby Robinson. Yes. I will uh, before we hop over to your second uh, show over at Twenty J Street. Yes. I just wanted to give a shout out to Abby, uh, who shared what do we have? Seven photographs, black and white photographs of projects that she documented that are yes. on view just around the corner in my office uh, at the gallery. So it's just it's a open space you can come on in and see those photographs uh, as well because they're really compelling um, and then one other thing that I want to just point out Russell which is in the office we have three very early paintings of yours um, they're on uh, they're sort of diptych format uh, they're very petite and very powerful uh, and those were among some of the earliest sort of abstract paintings that you made right Right, those are the only paintings I was able to make in that small room. So the paintings are, I think the paintings are, are seven by nine inches in two pieces. Something like that. Yeah, in two pieces. And the two pieces and they're sort of two pieces that are kind of like pushed together. They're sort of yeah. abutted together. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were on sort of raw materials that you found, right? Yeah, they were on um, plywood, pieces of plywood and printer's blocks that I found in, in the loft I was staying in on Cooper Square at the time. I so, so, yes, yeah, so, so definitely don't miss those. Uh, there's three sort of black and white, graphite white and white paintings that are on like really like raw material that I feel like set the stage for everything you've done since that point, for sure. I feel that way too, only because it's taking two, two separate things, putting them together to make another thing, right? And that becomes a situation. So that kind of, you know, that sensibility still follows me, yeah. Right, and with, and with a very specific color added to yeah. each of those sections, like each of those yeah. segments, which is cool. Great, yeah. so be sure to check those out as well uh, when you come over to see Russell's show over at the gallery. And just keeping an eye on the time, let's switch over yeah. to the big installation that you've done over at uh, 20 J Street, 28 J Street, uh, which is just three blocks over from the gallery. We were able to secure through the generosity of Two Trees, uh, which is a real estate company. There are landlords down in Dumbo. Yeah. Uh, an empty storefront 
space, I have a large space, actually larger than the gallery that we have. And they lent it to us for the next uh, couple of weeks in order for you to realize a project uh, that is both site specific and site sensitive um, to the kind of dynamics of that location and the construction that's going on across the street. So you've um, had a number of different kinds of construction materials delivered to the space, mm -hmm. including things like pallets of cinder block, you know, bundles of PVC pipe and metal wall studs, and then like sheets, like many sheets of four by eight plywood. Um, yeah, so traditional plywood. materials that you've used, yes? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, for years and years, I've been doing this work in, in Europe uh, since the mid nineties, this kind of work where I take, I take a uh, materials used in everyday use, trans, transform it with paint into, into a, a painting sculpture situationally place it in out in the world and um eventually it gets reclaimed uh, by the people who have lent me the materials and it gets reused for the purpose it was originally manufactured to be used for uh and i hadn't had that much of an opportunity to do it in the united states except um, I think one of the earliest opportunities was down uh, in, in, at the Ringling School of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida, where uh, Kevin Dean at the time was was the um, he was the director at the gallery there. And uh, my father actually introduced my work to him and he says, oh, I want to meet Russell. So I met him. We talked about a project and he organized and they were happy to be building a new dormitory at the time. So it was, that was easy. You know, the guys that were building the dormitory like gave me 12 or 13 or 14 skids of cinder block and I made a piece down there and after it was over, they, re, they recycled it back into the construction. Um, I had made works uh, at a project five at five plus one in 2004, you know, when I was in Cleveland as, as, as a guest artist. Um, and so this project, on Plymouth and Jay gave me an opportunity to sort of reinforce ideas that were very, very uh, early done early on in the pool and show them having been done two weeks ago and now they're in the storefront. And I think that there's a, there's a, a relevance between the two for me personally in, in, the, uh, in the arc of the thinking about you know what I do, right? So those pro those those materials, when the time is right, contractor who who lent them to me, and I have to say, I don't I don't buy any of the stuff. I ask for sponsors to lend me something they're going to use for a particular purpose. Let me borrow it for a while. Let me transform it. Let me let me give it some legs. Let me give it some energy. Let me. Put it into a conversation and and and, uh, and a proposition about what art can be, and then when time's up and they need the material, well then it gets put on a construction site and then put into the into the building or whatever situation that is happening by the by the workers and the tradesmen, transforming what they do into an artwork. And there's also the idea of everybody that's working with me as a collaborator. So um, it's, for me, it's a very energizing and, and fertile experience in terms of exploring, you know, what, a, what an artwork can be. So that's what's over at, at, at 20J. There are examples of, of various stacks of materials that I've painted uh, to occupy that storefront. Mm -hmm. And this is the, uh, from what you were saying, at least from, from my knowledge, this is sort of the largest sort of site-specific project you've ever done in New York City, right? Yeah, yeah. Fabulous. So just definitely don't miss, don't miss this one if you guys uh, have the opportunity to see it. Um, it's really something. So you have uh, sort of a situation of mm -hmm. industrial materials that you've borrowed. And I right. love the fact that you're using sort of like building suppliers as collaborators in this process both delivering materials to you and when Russell 
or the, <laughs> it was terrible when we were installing this show, you were out there at like six in the morning with these guys, which work at the crack of dawn, like farmers That's delivering what, yeah. raw materials to you <laughs> in the pouring rain, trying to get right, them off the truck right, and right. into the space. And then they were right. soaking wet and you couldn't work on them. And you know, this, these are the things that like, don't get discussed. It just seems really is, seamless. This, this, and, right. But Matthew, this is no different than any other time. When I was in Switzerland doing a piece in Lech, it, 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 they delivered 25 skids of block to a ski resort in the snow. <laughs> Perfect. Right? So, and I had a, a week to make the piece and stack it. Right. The snowstorm passed, right? The, play, the people I was working with there got out a bunch of heaters, plugged them in, and, we, and hair dryers. And we were just blowing down the stone, evaporating all the water so I can get working on it. And um, that's what we do. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I love the idea too, that these, that these materials, yeah. once they get disassembled and the show is over and they get returned back to the builder or the building yes. supply company are right. going to end up in some construction somewhere, right. probably in New York city um, that we may or may not know about. I mean, we, right. We did this project, Russell, you can tell the story down in Oaxaca where the Oaxaca. materials were re repurposed. You did yes. a huge installation with PVC pipes and we later learned what? That uh, after they were given back to the, the, um, the material supplier, some contractors purchased the material and um, Stefan Boddicker, Emmy's husband, saw them. And I, Emmy, you may have been there with Stefan at the time. But he took some photographs of these pipes being used in an open parking garage as drainage, as drainage pipes. And so, you know, you here you have an open parking garage in, in Oaxaca, uh, and uh, you look up, and it's a normal, like a normal plumbing system. You'd see in, in a garage, you'd see the exposed pipes, whether they're PVC or cast iron, but they were they were. Uh, white PVC pipes, and then they used whole sections that ran for, uh, you know, maybe three or four or five yards of the painted day glow color. And uh, with no thought whatsoever that, is it art or not? They didn't care, it was material to be used. But for me, it was, uh, it was, a, it was terrific. Yeah, because- For you, it's definitely art. So just read- Definitely art. Your, yeah, it's absolutely. Both. It's definitely art because at, at a point, I, I just do not have any notion of what it should be, right? It, it just, it gets done one way. Um, it manifests itself in, 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 that, in that place. And then when it gets recycled, we don't know what's going to happen, but it doesn't change its identity. It only, it only goes back to the way it's supposed to be used. Right, very, very cool. So those pipes were recognizable because they were painted a very specific day glow yellow that you love to use, this sort of like day yeah. glow yellow enamel paint, yeah. which is also the key color that is happening over at 20 J Street. And I, in the couple of minutes we have left for, for, for our conversation, yeah. I just want to talk about like your use of color specifically. Um, you have a ten tendency to go with sort of the sort of either like the industrial commercial construction kind of color palette, so day glow yellow, kind of this orange that's fluorescent, this kind of fire red. Right. I've seen you also do works in jet black, in silver metallic, in kind of an off-white. Uh, can you talk about sort of what attracts you to these colors, how you're thinking about color as it relates to, I don't know, maybe more kind of quotidian ideas of like abstract painting? Yeah, well, it, it, are these it, painterly it, decisions or are they coming from somewhere else? I don't have to mix it. It comes out of the can. I mean, it's it, the whole this whole series that that started uh, uh, on the um, and it, it with the pool too. I mean, I it was I just got some white enamel and painted it white. Uh, the the idea that uh, I was making ca paintings on canvas in the uh, in the early eighties like like a renaissance painting with glaze after glaze after glaze after glaze of color suspended in matte varnish and 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 turpentine and linseed oil and building this this volume of color um i was making four paintings a year and then when i started working on the stacks and the plywood i would just call the lumber yard up they would deliver eight or ten sheets of plywood two gallons of paint and i'd have 
four pieces made in a week. And it was so, so invigorating. It was great. You know, and each one of those pieces were interchangeable because everything is modular. And so I thought the, the best way to do this and the whole immediacy of it and at the level that I really wanted to um, uh, communicate uh, what painting could be was this automatic, the paint's already made, everybody buys paint that's already made, no one makes their own paint anymore. I mean, maybe, maybe a few people do. And some of us mix stuff and shade stuff and, and, and are interested in different values of how paint appears. For me, I was in a battle with monochrome painting at the time. And I decided to, to challenge monochrome painting by using one color on different surfaces. Is it a monochrome painting? Does it even approach the concept of monochrome painting? But it's still only one color. So I gave it an industrial, uh, I used it in an industrial way. And, for, and 40 years on, this is still a question that yes. persists, right? Is this a, yeah. is this a, a monochrome painting? Is this a, is this a thing? Yeah. Right. Great. And the color is the, is the, like I said to you, we've talked before about this. I said the color is the glue that holds it all together. Mm -hmm. From unit to unit to unit, if there's 100 units in a piece, it's the color that, that glues it all together as, as one idea. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And then one last uh, uh, thing for you, Russell, which is at 20 J Street, 28 J Street, um, facing one of the windows, you've mm -hmm. sort of set up and installed this very large television monitor um, with a sl another slideshow, this time a digital slideshow of images from your FS project. Uh, right. Can you talk about what's playing on that monitor? Yeah. To kind of fill us in on the details so we know. Sure. Thanks, Peter Demos, for the TV. <laughs> and uh, FS represents found sight. And found sight is something many artists have worked with in the past. It's recognizing things that exist in the world that influence your work. Uh, in my case, it happens to be uh, construction materials that are placed by others for their own use, whether they're staged in the street, staged inside a construction site, and they influence the way in which I think about the presence of my work and how my work lives in the world. Uh, so that is a series of, uh, on the monitors, a slideshow, a series of over uh, 250 images I've taken over the years of different places and different parts of the world that all uh, have the same thing in common is that there are construction materials placed by somebody other than me that influence the way I see things. Fantastic. And they are directly facing Russell, nothing other than a gigantic empty hole in the ground, site. which is a construction site. Yes. Right. <laughs> so they're right. like, the, the context could not be better. So yeah, there's, 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 a new, there's a new building going up right across the street. Right. Yeah, so found site and actual site sort of mirroring and echoing each other. Um, That's right. That's right. So, uh, so be sure to see that as well um, if you can and uh, spend as much time with it as you can because it's re the, the, the variety of the site and the things that you've documented and identified being kind of worthy of photographing is it's really, really um, remarkable. So, so um, that is uh, it for me. I would love to spend the remainder of our time together with questions from all of you, um, feel free to raise your hand physically and unmute yourselves. If you'd like to type a question into the chat field, I will help moderate here, but I see we already have a question that came in um, from Chris Giannakos. And he uh, asks, Russell, do you find out where the pieces would pipe go after you're done with them? and get to photograph them for their kind of in their industrial situation? Or do you find out kind of serendipitously? Like, how do you know what happens? Or do you know? Hi, Barbara. <laughs> I, I, um, I find out occasionally uh, through all kinds of sources. Uh, in the five and five plus one project, and there's a film about this, we did specifically know when the, the materials that were painted according to the construction schedule was going to be put in the building. 
So we sent a film crew out to document that. Mm -hmm. So we were able to track it and actually go full circle on the idea. Then there's the idea that in Oaxaca, yeah, right? In Oaxaca, I left after a week. I mean, we made the piece and, and it was time to go back to New York. So we didn't know, but we left, we left uh, enough information with enough people, hopefully, to say, yeah, you know, watch out for this. If you see something, send me a photograph. And, and that happened and that was great. Um, and that's what I, I, I normally do. That's what I have to do. I can't be uh, everywhere uh, that I do the work and find out where what's going to happen to it. So mm -hmm. I just try to instill some responsibility or, or interest, you know, with the people that I work with. And if they're close enough to the situation, I'll get a photograph here or there. Mm. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. And that, and that, those, those photographs from Oaxaca, we didn't, Russell learn about them for like until like I remember it being at least a year later and Emmy and, and Stefan saying oh my god look what we found that's right chance we can't that's believe right. it. we were driving past and yeah, stopped yeah, the car and that. photographed this thing that was so go ahead was, Chris please wait until I finish speaking. go ahead Chris yeah. I, I, um, I'm very fascinated by the evolution of the work I just want to get your head on this uh, yeah. I like the fact that this comes from Columbia Yard let's say then it, it gets in your hands then you make a work of art and then it goes back to, uh, it goes into the building material. I don't know, do you feel that the, the spirit, it, it's still a work of art and that's sort of in the building now of in course. a different way, but it is a work of art still in there. Yes. I mean, yes. that really fascinates me. Yeah, the art, the art, the arc of the- the, the This artwork is in perpetuity. In yeah, really the, the, the arc of it is that the architecture has the possibility of becoming art because the art is, yeah totally integrated into structure, okay, um, by design, without the architect calling for it to be. <laughs> uh, and then once it gets covered up and most of this stuff disappears because it's because it's raw material that's, that gets covered with finished cladding, finished glass, finished walls, finished paint, most of it disappears. So then it becomes like archaeological. It's still art. But it's it becomes archaeological. Art. It's closed up now. It's That's in the walls. It's in the walls. Still. Still up. It's still art. It's still right. your art. Yes. In some way. Yes. It never leaves. It's, uh, yeah, it lives it's on. Like some Egyptian mummy. It's my it's <laughs> a Trojan horse or something in there. Right? The, only way, that. the only way I know how to handle entropy. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Restore it. So, Great. So Emmy actually chimed in in the chat field that uh, she's she wrote here. We also saw a truck driving down the street in Oaxaca loaded with Russell's painted PVC pipes, and they followed it, of course. You know? <laughs> so like, you know, this is uh, became yeah. a mad a mad chase, which I totally love. So so great question, Chris. Thank you for for asking that. I Thank see you. that Nancy is unmuted. Nancy, did you have a question? Yeah. Hi, Russell. How are you? Good Hi. to see you. Good. What happened to the what happened to the swimming pool at CW Post? Was it oh, demolished? It was, no, it, is it no, still there? It's not still there, unfortunately. It, it sometime in the '90s, it was filled in. Oh. And I just, I'm just upset that it wasn't me who filled it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Too bad. Yeah, too bad it wasn't me. But you know, I, know, yeah, yeah. What did I know, right? Yeah, but it's not there anymore. So. Uh, but I did, I did hear back from a few people and I didn't get any photographs of it, but that there was a rectangle of grass there that was a different color than the other rectangle. Mm, that's mm -hmm. right. And that kind of, makes, kind of makes sense, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the pool is no more, but clearly on view at the gallery when you guys come to check out the show, for sure. Uh, are there other questions? I'm happy to wait. Yeah. I have plenty more to wrestle while we're while we're waiting for hands to be raised. Sure. Uh, let's see here. So Ellen writes that uh, she grew up right next to CW Post uh, okay. and lived there in 1979. Where was it exactly? The question. Well, it was at the art department up at the art center, and the art center was the summer home of E. F. Hutton. E. F. Hutton was married to Marjorie M. Merriweather Post, and he uh, that was his house and his pool. 
And when the Post family uh, donated all the property and land, the stables and everything so that Long Island University could be built, um, the art department took that part of the, the property. It was way back uh, south of, um, I guess it was uh, 25A. So if, so if the entrance to CW Post is on 25A and you went all the way south to the back of the college, that's where the uh, pool was, beyond the stables. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, history solved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, bringing back memories here. Thank you, Ellen, for that question. Are there other other questions, thoughts, reflections? Mm -hmm. I certainly have one if nobody else does. I have a question for you, Russell, regarding sort of the sighting, <laughs> sighting of work in space, right? So you're receiving materials over at uh, at 20 J Street, right? Just we'll use that as an example. The materials, you ordered a certain number of pallets, a certain number of bundles of things. You had a sense of the, the volume of material you needed. And yeah. you worked with the sort of the delivery guys in placing those materials, right, on site. Um, how did you go about doing that? How did you know where to site what? What were you looking for in relationship between individual stacks of materials? In relationships between various kinds of materials, where they were placed. Some are very close to like the, the front windows, the front door. Some of them are really pushed far back. Like, how, what are you looking for when you cite materials in a space? Well, I've been doing construction work for almost 45 years. And I could never figure out why anybody puts anything anywhere on a construction job, other than it's the easiest place to put it at the moment, and maybe the easiest place from where to take it to build something, with, right? I couldn't do any more. I couldn't do any more than that in terms of um, trying to get any thought in my head of exactly where it should go, other than if I was building something in the space, where would I want to put? It? So it's trying to be as as close and casual to the fact that the placement is really not that thought out. But would, but would work function anyway, because um, it's like what you put together in your head when you see it, right? So that's a little bit like fluxus in a way that, and the everyday of just seeing things and it comes together as a recognition of, of a placement, I think. I never make yeah. diagrams. I never make diagrams of the work. It's all pretty much intuitive of where things go and where things end up. Fabulous. Yeah, I love that. I love that aspect of, of your work for sure. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, other thoughts, anyone? Yes, uh, I see Mark and Nancy. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, sure. I unmuted you and then remuted you by mm -hmm. accident. One other second. Sorry about that, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Russell. It's Irene and Mark from hi. South Dakota. Um, I'm curious about your childhood and your artistic leanings. Were you one of these little kids that, that was always painting or drawing or, or seeing things and trying to duplicate? Or was this something that came forth uh, in your construction years? I was painting and doing stuff when I was very young. My father was an artist. So everything you know, in the house was, you know, there was always stuff around to work with and play around with. So, um, and when I was in jail, I'm really kidding. Uh, we, uh, so my brother and I, yeah, we had, we had a lot of uh, moments where we, we made a lot of stuff all the time. Okay. Yeah. All right, you, you, you got it properly from your father. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great question, though. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think this is a question like, how do we, I asked this of my students too, like, how did we end up here, right? Like, when we start class, like, how did we get here? And everyone has sort of a different story. And that's a really interesting, Russell, that this was in a way, and it's unusual, I have to admit, that this was family business, right? Like, you had been doing yeah. this, you've yeah, been I've seeing been doing... this at home, 
yeah. and you were and encouraged also, to do this at home. Yeah. And also, my father was a uh, he was a uh, an advertising uh, director. He had his own uh, advertising studio on Madison Avenue. And when I was in um, junior high school, in high school, I would go in and, and help him in the studio. I would I would run uh, jobs and photographs back and forth to the photostatter. I don't know. Photostat is a word that's probably uh, yeah. you know, long yeah. dead by now, but you know, Chris, Chris, you would know this. You know, Chris, this. You know that. <laughs> uh, and when I was there, I had I had the full array of things too. I had a little I had a little table, a tabaret. I had colored pencils and ink and stuff. And so it was just like it, so much fun to get into it and do it. Mm. So it was it was uh, a natural, even though you was to the jeans. <laughs> Fantastic question, though. Thank you, Russell. Uh, we have time for one other question. If anyone has a question, looks like Sharon Matthew. and Pat. Matthew. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. How do? What do you think about chance? Mm -hmm. One and two. Are you ever surprised by how something turns over without your conscious manipulation of? It? I think chance is fabulous, and I'm always amazed and welcome the serendipitous in my work mm -hmm. as a process, totally. Right. Yeah. It's what makes it, it's what makes the next piece happen. <laughs> right? Thank you. Thank you. Right? And an example of that, yeah. just to uh, add something here, is that, uh, again, to, to go back to this PVC pipe, project you did in Oaxaca, Mexico, you went down there with a space right? and with a, a, a construction building supplier identified who would loan you materials. Right. And that was it, right? Um, tell us how you went about oh, yeah. finding the materials yeah. and walk That's us through what that looks like because it's all about serendipity. Yeah. This is, this is, this is terrific. You know, like Emmy and I were talking about um, doing a block piece using CMU concrete block and sort of doing something along the lines of what's already been done um, in Sarasota and in the five states, five sites uh, project and in Europe. And I really never really worked on what I ended up working with there. We get down to Oaxaca and get settled in and it's time for me to go meet the guy who's gonna give me everything that I want to make my work. And we go over to this gigantic material supply place. I mean, anything in the world you wanted was there. And Emmy and I are driving around. We're driving through the various yards of material. And that's an inside warehouses with all kinds of wow, I stuff. Hard. And we do not see any concrete block. <laughs> and I'm starting to scratch my head and I'm saying, Emmy, where's the block? So we find some guy and, he, and we tell him why we're there. And he goes, oh yeah, yeah, we know you're coming and everything. And, but we don't have any block because <laughs> the boss took all the block because he's building his house in the country, <laughs> right? Just true story. So there's, there was like one skid of block. So I said to Emmy, what should she show us? He says, well, you could take half something else. So I said to Emmy, well, what do you think we should do? We drive around a little bit more, looking around, and I see this whole wall of PVC pipe, all this stuff stacked against the wall. It's like 10, 12 feet high. It's on racks, all different kinds of PVC, 10 feet long, 12 feet long, 14 feet long. And I say to the guy, can I have all of that stuff? <laughs> and he said, yeah, if you want it, we'll bring it to you. That was it. So that was the piece. That became the piece, right? They brought it. They brought it into El Mupo. We put it in the. We put it in the courtyard, and uh, they stacked it up. I didn't touch it. They stacked it up the way they stacked it up, and no direction. I just. We just filmed it. We watched it. Took some photographs, and then the next day, I the next few days, uh, I made the work. So that's the, that's the joy of it. That's for me. That's the joy of it. <laughs> and Emmy went to, and Emmy adds, and it was perfect. Yes. 
So on that <laughs> note, on that note, we will wrap things up this evening. Thank you uh, all very much for joining Thank us this Matthew. evening. Thank you, Matthew. Really Thank enjoyed you. the conversation. Russell. And a big round of applause Thank for you. Russell for such an amazing and insightful talk. Thank you, uh, thank much, you, Matt. Russell, and uh, uh, I just uh, really enjoy talking to you. I could talk with Russell all day long. In yeah, fact, he was at the gallery last Saturday. We talked the whole day, all day, literally all day. seven <laughs> hours straight, and we weren't we barely got anywhere. So, really excited to uh, to have this talk this evening, and thank you all for joining us. Now, the uh, first couple of installments of Russell's multi part show uh, are up through May seventh, so a couple more weeks uh, to see the pool project. We believe that uh, the project over at 20 J Street, again, because it's in an available space that was empty and lent to us, uh, we will have through at least the middle of May. It may get extended, it might not. Right. So definitely stop by to see these first couple of installments uh, for sure. And then we will uh, continue those with the next installment of uh, works from Russell's studio. Russell, you want to talk about sort of the second thing that's happening at Minus yeah. Space? Yeah, the second installment will be the stack works. Uh, works on plywood um, and glass that started in the early 80s uh, that I and I, I still am working with them, you know, presently. So there'll be present work, work that was done over the last couple of years, plus other works that date back to the uh, mid to late 80s, uh, a little survey of those. Uh, and then after that installment, uh, the final one will be my most recent works on glass, which are uh, I entitled the uh, needle series, which are very uh, vertical, thin pieces of glass suspended from a nail. Um, and those will, uh, while while the other installations are still up, and in the garden, and in the Hilliard uh, garden, there's a series of uh, pieces of wood that are painted bright yellow, and they're meant to be used by the people in the garden to uh, for the gardening. So I, I stacked a whole bunch of uh, material up against the garden shed, painted it, and uh, people that are gardening in that area, if they need a piece of wood or a stake for a tree or something, uh, that work gets distributed throughout the garden and that's painted bright, screaming, big, low yellow. Ooh, that Fabulous, so, so lots to look forward to for sure. And again, just uh, thank you so much, Russell, and thanks to everyone here for joining us. And um, I will see you at the gallery to continue this conversation. So stop by and we will uh, talk soon. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good everybody, Bye. thank you very much. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>